Preface The magic of the imagination can never be underestimated when it comes to children. And what happens when these children grow to teens and so on? Their imagination and their magic only continue to get stronger. A normal child doesn't stand a chance against the children we call spooks. It is without question against all the laws of the land to bring a child into this new world order without imagination magic. This is the law, and all will obey it, or whosoever does not will be put to death. In the year 2035, religion was banned, and Christians were executed. Any hint of any deity belief became illegal. The Antichrist, or the devil, or whatever anyone wanted to call him, was loose upon the earth, and would be so for 1,000 years. He created hate and war, and it seemed that just as Korea was about to wipe us out with the push of one little button, he broke their fingers and their necks. The world was saved. That's what you'd like to call it. After a while, we all realized that there would never be another president. We realized that after John Beekman ran for office, and the Antichrist had him crucified in the center of the city, he made everyone attend. Everyone had a choice, yes. Attend or hang beside John Beekman. Everyone attended. In 2035, our homes were raided, and any child under the age of six was taken, and any child the age of six through 15 was executed. The smallest children were taken to Castle Marks, and that is where they remained while the employees of the Antichrist experimented on them until they were perfected. They were then released back in civilization, where they would terrorize the world. These freaks were called spooks. Chapter 1 Why doesn't someone just try to kill him? My father said, as we sat in the dark of the living room in front of the fireplace. My mother whispered quickly, as if someone we couldn't see and was not even in the room might overhear. Hush, Vernon. Don't talk like that. You want to get us all killed? My father was a gentle soul for the most part, but since the election he had grown hard and cold and angry. I'm sure it was out of sheer worry for us, his family, but my mother was right. If anyone overheard him talking like that, they would surely turn him over to the street police, and from there we would all be executed. Oh, for Christ's sake, Sally, no one can hear us. My father retorted in the same loud whispered tone as my mother had. Don't you count on it, Vernon. You remember the Lewises across the street, don't you? Their own child turned them in for words they spoke, and they were drug out into the streets and shot execution style. My father's eyes became angrier. I'd kill them myself if I could get close enough. This was the way of the world now. Everyone was scared, and no one had rights. No one was allowed to shop or hunt or drive. All stores opened once, monthly. And then you had your list given by the council on what you were allowed to buy and how much you were permitted to buy. No one was allowed to have a vehicle. All cars and trucks were taken to a city out west named Winston and parked on every street, blocking entrance and departure. I looked at the Big Ben wind-up clock. It was 9.15 p.m., they had shut the electric down two hours ago, and all were supposed to be in bed asleep. But we had stayed up later, every night, by the fire talking. Being caught awake and talking was now illegal and punishable by beatings. The first time. The second time you were thrown in jail, where you would stay for thirty days and nights. No electric and very little food and water. I had seen people that had been released after their thirty days, and they didn't look like the same people that had gone in. They were skinny and weak and dirty. They, that I knew of, had never committed that crime again. I am but just a bystander in this world now, it seems. I watch and listen ever so closely. I am afraid to even breathe at times. I was told that I was trained as an infant to be exactly the way the system wants me to be. But still, I love my family, and I will do whatever I can to protect them. Dear God, I cannot believe the people elected him again. What is wrong with people? Vernon was upset, and anyone watching the election with him could hear it in his voice and see it in his face. 
I sat on the love seat across from my father, and I cried. I cried softly and quiet, and so he didn't notice. He was wrapped up in the television and the election taking place. Andrew Lucifer. It didn't even seem real. He had served one term already. I could have sworn that the people would have been ready to vote him out, but a guy named John Beekman had run against him and had lost the election big time. The reporters were talking with Mr. Beekman right now and asking him if he would run again in four years. He answered, absolutely. John Beekman was a fine man. He was kind and considerate and compassionate. Even at my young age, I was ashamed of our country for turning its back on such a good man, for such a devil man as was Andrew Lucifer. Four years. Four more years of cruelty and greed and hate. Four more years of fear. Surely someone would kill, or at least attempt to kill, Andrew Lucifer. Who knew why people elected him yet once again? My father is a good man. He believes in helping others and making people smile. My mother is a nurse. She's a good woman and believes in taking care of her family and helping others in times of crisis. I have an older brother, and his name is Cole. He's nine years old. I watch my older brother play about the house, and he has no worries, it seems. I want to play with him, but I'm too small at three years old, and he won't let me play with him. Son of a bitch! That son of a bitch! That's my father, screaming in the background about the election. Cole stopped playing long enough to look up at our father and cringe as if his head hurt. And then he went right back to his playing. I continued to weep silently. I knew my father would scoop me up and try to make me stop crying, but he was so worried about this election that I didn't have the heart to interrupt him. My mother was at work, and she wouldn't be home for another three hours. She would pick me up straight away and cuddle me. I knew this, and yet I also knew that it was still three hours away. 2. As of this year and it actually appears that it's been this way for quite some time, the freedom we always had to choose our leaders was gone. Andrew Lucifer would remain in charge of our country until an undetermined time, maybe forever. My father was now always depressed and angry. Gone far away was my gentle and loving father. President Andrew Lucifer was always on the television and harping about immigrants and foreigners and just anyone that wasn't exactly like him. He inspired anger and hate and prejudice and greed. Anything that most people deem sinful, he inspired and instigated. He was what people feared the most, and yet everyone, excluding her own family and a choice few others, voted him in over and over. It probably wasn't fair to say they voted him in willingly. They really had no choice. It was remarkable, to say the least. I was only three years old. I was expected to act a certain way, say certain things, be a certain way. I was all of those things to some degree. At home, my parents insisted I behave normally and enjoy my life. But in public, I had to be careful. I could not show my love for my family. I could not smile or include myself in small talk. I am a spook, a child of the government. Or so the government thinks. Let me go back to when this all started, and maybe you will truly understand, and maybe, just maybe, you can stop it. 3. This election had been a joke. My father said it all the time. My mother wouldn't say much in return, but would softly nod her head in agreement. After all of the campaigning was finished and the hateful things that had been said and done between the two parties, Andrew Lucifer had won. He won even though he had publicly made fun of overweight women, disabled people, slandered people of color, openly hated immigrants, and openly hated and spoke against the poor. He won even though he admitted to being a low-life womanizer. He won. My father said many times that because he won, regardless of what he said or did, that it should tell us a lot about the people that we associate with. Again, my mother would gently nod. I'd already been through my training in mind change at three years old. I knew what was expected of me. 
but I could not unlove my parents. I did, though, have to pretend in public and treat them as indifferent. They knew this and schooled me all the time, not so much to save themselves, but to save me. I was to constantly read the minds of passers-by. And if those people had unclean thoughts of President Lucifer, I was to report it. In a few years after much more programming, I would be able to disintegrate these people on the spot. I prayed all the time that no matter what the government did to me, that I would not become like them, unfeeling and malicious. You could not spot my good heart by my looks or my personality. Even at this young age, I was so ahead of the norm, and I was getting better at it with each passing day. I loved my parents. I prayed no one could take that away. At my young age, I had already been witness to crucifixions and beheadings of those who refused to follow the New World Order. I watched as other small children scanned the minds of passers-by and would lift their little heads to the parents and point to the passer-by that had the impure thoughts. The parents would then take a gun from their pockets and immediately kill the passer-by. No questions, no warning and others would continue walking as if nothing had happened. If they by chance would have shown emotion or fear, they too would have been scanned. My parents were pros. They took medicine before we went out anywhere, and it calmed their thoughts to almost nothing. I could hear the thoughts of many passers-by, but I never once repeated them. Never. Chapter 2 one. Our first ever black president, Charles Lyndon, was up for replacement. He had served this country for two consecutive terms, eight years total. If we could have elected him for a third term, I believe most would have. He was compassionate and kind and soft-spoken. There were now two of the four people still campaigning. Each had their speeches and promises, and each had their faults and good points. My mother and father watched and listened intently, on a daily basis, while each argued their benefits. My father was dead set against Andrew Lucifer from the beginning. I believe it wasn't so much his name as it was his personality that kept my father so adamantly against him. Andrew Lucifer was obnoxious and mean, but his personality only seemed to instigate people that were normally nice and loving people to become mean and vicious too. I guess that meant that they were always that way, and he just enabled them to show it. Andrew Lucifer won. He won the election, regardless of the mean things he said and did. People praised him openly for his prejudice and his hatred. We're going to have to leave the country, dear, because I cannot live in a country where hatred is so thick. My father threatened this, but never followed through with it. He should have followed through with it, and I knew this even at such a young age. The television was always on. The news was always on. Andrew Lucifer was always on. One day my parents were cleaning the yard and a neighbor walked over to speak with my dad. My mother excused herself and picked me up out of the playpen where I was sitting in the shade and took me back inside the house. She got busy inside cleaning, and suddenly we heard a scream. It was a woman's scream. My mother looked shocked because there had been no woman with the neighbor. She rushed to the window and peered out. The neighbor man was lying in the road, bloodied and bent out of shape. The woman was kneeling over him and screaming. My mother grabbed me up and ran back outside to stand beside my father. What happened, Vernon? she asked. My father stood motionless, watching the woman. He listened without a break in his numb looks as she reached out to people standing around and begged for someone to help the man. No one moved. Beside the man lying on the ground was a large metal-looking piece of crap. The metal thing was still twitching. In my young mind, I knew what had happened, or at least I was sure that I knew. My mother turned with me in her arms and walked back inside the house. She cuddled me tightly. My father came in soon after. He held one finger to his lips as he entered, aiming this at my mother. It was a signal not to say a word about what had just happened, and she didn't. Silent tears fell down her face as she snuggled her wet face into my hair. I felt sorry for my mother. Mother was sensitive. 
Finally, that night, as we sat in our living room in front of the fire, my father told about what had happened earlier that day, when the neighbor man had come to visit. George was tired of lying and of trying to live a lie. He told me about Lila, his wife. He said that she'd been diagnosed with cancer and that the doctor had told her that their insurance would not cover a complete extensive treatment. George said that he himself had gone to the insurance and begged them to extend care to his wife. He said that the insurance had declined his plea. George had dwelled on this for months until his wife's health began to decline visibly, and then he had gone to an alley doctor. The alley doctor agreed for the right amount of money to extend treatment for his wife. George agreed. Here, Father stopped and took a deep breath. He reached for his glass of water and sipped it slowly. Setting it down, he began again. After her first three treatments, the law caught on to the doctor and the place was raided. His wife died three months later, or last week to be exact. George had said nothing to anyone until he spoke to me today. As he was walking back to his house, this piece of metal came out of nowhere and plowed into him. It's as if the metal was alive somehow. Father stopped talking and just slowly shook his head back and forth as if in deep thought and confusion. She killed herself right in front of him. That was a sad day and night. The first of many, it seems. Two. Celia, sit still, child, or this will hurt. The nurse spoke softly to her. She could and would remember this moment until the day she would die. Compassion still existed. The humming of the machine arm sounded on Celia's left, near her ear. At two years old, she did not understand what was happening. But she feared it. The arm came closer, and Celia strained her eyes to the outside corner of her eyelids to see it. She moaned aloud, even though nothing had yet touched her. The nurse rubbed her back and whispered to her softly, Calm down, sweetie. I'm here for you, and you will be okay. This was the start. Celia became the first converted child, age three, female, number 60. The number 60 code was embedded in Celia's forehead. The naked eye could not see it, but when scanned with a small metal scan bar, it lit up like Christmas. Once the establishment found that it did indeed work, they gathered all children below the age of six and implanted a number in their forehead. From that point and procedure, they were taken to the kite building and brainwashed, literally. During the brainwashing of these small children, a new code was embedded, which enabled the child to have telepathy, and the emotional section of their brain was to be burnt. The children were to focus on traitors of the Antichrist and point them out so that they could be obliterated. This may include the parent of the child. All were targeted, no exceptions.